Welcome to video number three. So far, we have journeyed through the world of acid, the world of bases, the world of indicators, and the world of testing for ions. We really are motoring. Now we will see what happens when acids react with metals or bases, the production of salts, just like the salt you put on your chips. We will cover how soluble and insoluble salts are formed, naming these salts, and finally I will explain, at last, what titrations are. So, let's get going, shall we? So I have mentioned that acids and bases react to form a salt. This is known as a neutralisation reaction, as the acidic conditions and the basic conditions come together to form water, which is neutral. The other product of this reaction is what's known as a salt. A salt is formed from the negative ion of an acid combined with the positive ion of a base. This is a general rule. An acid plus a base makes a salt plus water. Both metal hydroxides and metal oxides react with acids to form salts. For example, hydrochloric acid reacts with sodium hydroxide to form sodium chloride and water. What is sodium chloride most often used as? That's right, table salt. Another, slightly different reaction of an acid and a base is an acid and a carbonate. Reacting this way, not only is a salt and water formed, but carbon dioxide as well. As we established in the previous video, carbon dioxide can be tested for by using lime water, which will turn cloudy. Once the salt has been formed through these reactions, it won't be immediately obvious as the salt will be an aqueous solution. Therefore, we would need to evaporate the water which has been formed. After this, pure crystals of the salt will be formed. This is true for any soluble salt. Once the water has evaporated, what remains will be crystals of the pure salt. This is all well and good for salts formed from soluble bases, but many bases are in fact insoluble. Therefore, the process for producing salts from these insoluble bases is slightly different. To start with, we have to add the powdered form of the insoluble base to the acid until the powder doesn't disappear anymore. At this point, the powder is in excess to the acid, meaning there is more of the base than there was of the acid. We then filter the mixture to remove the excess powder from it, leaving just what happened when the base reacted with an acid, a solution of salt plus water. We can then put this solution into an evaporating dish and gently heat it in a water bath until small crystals form. At this point, we can consider the mixture as saturated. If we then leave the mixture at room temperature for a few days, larger crystals will form. These can then be dried and are the pure form of the salt that we wanted to make. So that covers the production of soluble salts from soluble and insoluble bases, but there are also insoluble salts. To produce them, we use what is known as a precipitation reaction. This is where a precipitate is formed through a reaction. We've already encountered such a reaction in the test for sulfate ions forming a white precipitate. Forming an insoluble salt is very similar to this process. We react together two soluble salts and they react and form an insoluble salt. Once the insoluble salt is formed, it can be extracted by filtration then washed and dried to obtain the pure form. When you're looking to create an insoluble salt, a good place to start is with nitrates. Every nitrate is soluble, so they make ideal starting points. Next up, let's name the salts that we make. Naming salts is pretty easy as long as the rules of naming are followed. The rules of naming are as follows. Firstly, we take the name of the metal we had in the base, for example, sodium, calcium, magnesium. Then we take the appropriate suffix from the type of acid we use. Using the three main acids we discussed in the first videos, we get the following suffixes. For hydrochloric acid, we have the suffix chloride. For sulfuric acid, we have the suffix sulfate. And for nitric acid, we have the suffix nitrate. It's worth mentioning here that the suffix chloride ends in ide and it contains no oxygen, where the other two suffixes end in ate and do contain oxygen. Using these rules, we can predict the names of salts formed. For example, if barium hydroxide and sulfuric acid react together, we can predict that the salt formed will be barium sulfate. These rules extend even to weaker acids and different bases. Finally, I would like to talk about something I've referenced a few times across my videos, but not directly explained until now, titrations. Titrations are used in chemistry to ascertain the concentration of an unknown acid or base by slowly adding a known concentration of a base or acid respectively. This works on the principles of neutralization, which we have discussed, and indicators, which we have also discussed. An indicator shows us when a solution changes from one color to another, indicating that the unknown solution has been neutralized. Using the information of what volume of known concentration we have used, we can then calculate the number of moles we used, and then the number of moles in the unknown solution, and finally the concentration of the unknown solution. To start with, we put a known volume of the unknown solution into a conical flask with a little bit of indicator. 
We then place this flask onto a white tile so the colour changes more prominent. After that, we fill a burette with acid or alkali of known concentration so the meniscus rests on the 0ml marking. Burettes are more accurate than pipettes when titrating, as they are graduated in milliliters. The contents of the burette are added dropwise to the unknown solution until a colour change begins to occur. We can then take a reading from the burette to ascertain how much liquid has been added. Then, all we need to do is calculate the concentration of the unknown liquid. Often, titrations are done multiple times, and an average is taken of the results to give a more accurate reading. So that's the end of the third lesson. Only one more lesson to go, and it's one that most of you have been dreading. Maths. But it is very useful maths. So let's get to it and see you in the next lesson.